welcome to Keyforge Public Radio with your host, Zach Armstrong. Hello, dear listener. I am so excited that you are joining me for this episode where we're talking about the fact that Keyforge is a racing game. So this is pretty obvious, right? You already know that you need to win a game of Keyforge. You already know that you need to forge three keys. But the something we're, we're going to be going over is, of course, the, the, the strategy mindset, how you have to think about a game of Keyforge in order to play your best, in order to make decisions turn to turn, or a meta call if you're bringing something to a tournament, that are going to give you your best chances at success, right? And so... It is actually quite essential to review the fact that Keyforge is a racing game with checkpoints because this is essential to how the game is played, the pace of the game with the forging a key step. That's what I mean by checkpoints there. Spending that amber to forge a key at the start of your turn. Very important part of how the game plays. And so while it seems obvious, we're going to dive into everything this means on a high level so that you have a foundation for exactly how to think about a game of Keyforge turn to turn and on a high strategic level with regards to it being a racing game. So like any other game where the players end up ranked, right, like a win or a loss, you rank first, second or third. There's a binary winner and loser in Keyforge's case because it has two players. You simply need to fulfill the victory condition before your opponent. And once you've won, it doesn't matter how close your opponent was to winning because the game is over. Right? And like I said, it might sound like I'm stating the obvious. And honestly, I totally am. (laughs) Keyforge is an infinite puzzle, one of my favorite phrases, where costs aren't strictly quantitative, right? The cost of a card, the cost of a decision isn't strictly quantitative. That means, you know, you can't, that there's not a, a resource cost on a card. It doesn't cost five credits or five mana to play this card. So it's often difficult to evaluate in Keyforge when you need to push for that finish line and when you need to spend time controlling your opponent. If you've played Magic the Gathering or dove deep into the blogosphere, you may be hearing my intentional reference to the old Magic the Gathering blog, Who's the Beatdown? Now that blog is filled with uh, references to a lot uh, to a specific game situation and a whole lot of Magic the Gathering cards that I don't completely understand on a deep level. But the magic of that blog post is that the concept, who's the beatdown, who should be pushing for the finish and who should be trying to make decisions that slow the opponent down so they can get across instead, really is at the core of most card games. And Keyforge, honestly, is no exception, even though in many other ways it couldn't be more different from Magic with Gathering. Because in many other of the dueling card games, right, you attack a resource that's owned by your opponent. It might be their hit points, their life, or their life points, right? Your goal is to push a resource they own towards zero. In Keyforge, you're advancing yourself to that finish line by generating your own resource upon which the victory condition rests, right? Keys. You're generating keys, and primarily you're generating their ingredient, amber, which of course is gated by your forge a key step. Gating, right? Meaning meaning you get to the six amber required to forge a, a key at the default cost, but you're not forging a key right then, right? You're either going to play a key cheat that you know instructs you to forge a key uh, with a, a number of costs or situational modifiers on it, right? Or you've got to wait till the start of your next turn to see if you still have that amber lying around. So it's it's gated. It's gated. So the the racing, right? And the keys and the amber it's generally, it's more of a theming difference than anything else because you, you could have six counters of another kind that represent the ability to attack your opponent and at the start of your turn, that attack goes through and knocks out one of their, you know, three health points, for instance. Uh, but it's an important reminder that you need to think about how to advance your game plan. What's your plan to win? What tricks do you have up your sleeve? What can you expect your deck to do? What cards are important in this particular matchup. So even though this whole keeping the victory condition in mind thing is honestly core to really any game, even if you're playing, if you're playing a sport, if you're playing, you know, you're playing soccer, you're playing football, it is all about keeping that victory condition in mind. And how do you get to that victory condition before your opponent? Now, of course, the difference with a sport is often there's there's timers and in key forward, you're playing to that third key specifically. It's like if you played soccer, um, if you played football, to exactly three points. And once somebody got to those three points, then the game is over, right? That creates a dynamic around the the victory condition that you have to pay attention to and strategize around. 
So thinking of this, keeping this in mind is really important for making decisions in a game of Keyforge. If you oversimplify the decision-making process in this game, it comes down to just one question, right? How do I forge my third key before my opponent forges their third key? If you find the answer to this question, you win, <laughs> right? And that's kind of... That's almost that's almost a silly simplification, right? Because obviously the answer to the question, how do I forge my third key before my opponent forges their third key, is remarkably complicated. But if you use this concept as a guide for your decision making, that's going to help you win more games. So remember, the victory condition in Keyforge is forging three keys. This is not patronizing. This is something I forget, have forgotten, and still sometimes do forget if I'm getting tempted by acute play as well, right? If your path forward on any given turn isn't clear to you, you can just default to the path of action that gets you closest to the victory condition, that third key. I'm not saying that's always going to be a simple choice. Sometimes it is. Sometimes the obvious choice that might seem good isn't the strongest. And maybe that decision is actually going to change based on your matchup in case I'd say that's common. That is correct a lot of the time. Many times, this means the play that's going to gain you the most amber, right? With a couple of factors involved there. Maybe the, the right answer here lets you draw the most cards or sets you up closer to a big play, right? A combo out or slowing your opponent down more than you slow yourself down. One helpful way to think about Keyforge as a racing game is to think of a game that involves a literal race, Mario Kart. Uh, shout out to uh, my arch nemesis, D House of Unplayable, who came up with this at the first I heard it at least. Get across the finish line first in Mario Kart, right? It's a racing game with carts and crazy items. Get across that finish line first, you win. You just have to get there first, and that means the other person loses because you've hit your victory condition. But winning in Mario Kart, you know, starts to involve more than just speed, right? You need luck and skill with the items. You need to pick those items up and then use them at the right time. Maybe you need to aim well if it's a green shell that's not going to home in on your opponent, right? You got to aim that well. And if you're in the lead, there's always the blue shell to worry about, the item that somebody can can use and it goes and just hits the player in first and slows them down a whole lot, causing that player in first a huge setback. There are some mechanics like that in Keyforge, just a few, right? So to recap what we've talked about so far, Keyforge is a race, like Mario Kart. By default, you want to gain Amber as fast as you can, but sometimes you'll make the choice to draw more cards instead, to play some creatures to the board, interrupt your opponent's plans, or maybe you're setting yourself up for that big play down the line. There are a lot of paths that could lead to that third key. Some are obvious, some are dead ends, and some are shortcuts, right? The vast majority of them involve gaining amber and forging keys during your forge a key step after your turn begins. So the first time you sit down to play Key Forge or you've played a couple of games with a friend, all of this that we're talking about might be obvious to you, right? Or it might not. You might be familiar with the tendency of people who want to play strategically to play slowly, methodically, to keep their opponent down before they make their move, right? And that's been my tendency in the past as well. And sometimes, of course, that is the right move. In my case, when I began playing Keyforge, uh, I simply tried to keep slowing my opponent down without remembering that I needed to move towards the victory condition myself. This is pretty common. Maybe you've engaged in this or you've seen uh, another new player engage in this sort of thinking, right? Many people, perhaps you, intuitively understand that Keyforge is a racing game and that you play that way from the start. But sometimes your opponent will have all your creature removal options, all the right amber control at the right time, the key cost increases, and what happens is that they slow you down, keeping you from winning, then they glide across that finish line themselves, right? Back to referencing that old Magic the Gathering blog, who's the beatdown, right? They hung back and played control as you tried to be the beatdown, but you you weren't. You pushed and they controlled you, controlled you, you ran out of gas, and then they glided across that finish line, right? In the Mario Kart analogy, this is like you keeping the pedal to the metal and you went as fast as you could, but your opponent picked up some items and blasted you off the track, creating a gap big enough for them to reach the victory condition first. So that question of when you should try to control your opponent and when you should sprint ahead, it's a very complicated one with a vast number of principles and heuristics you can apply to it. The point of this first episode is to emphasize that victory condition, right? To say, hey, remember, get to that third key because as soon as you get there, it doesn't matter what they're doing. The, the game is over, they've lost and you've won. We want to remember that and apply decisions each turn that will get us closer to that win. 
it might sound silly to spend an entire episode, especially the first episode, right, discussing the fact that you need three keys in Keyforge to win. <laughs> but it's likely that you, like me, have sometimes lost focus on that goal. And you did a play, thought it was cool, it was cute, you got to pull off something, but it turns out you were just tempted into doing something ineffective that didn't actually push towards that third key. You might have fought an opponent's creature off the board when the right choice was to gain as much amber as possible, or simply play as many cards from hand as you could. Sometimes you need to resist the temptation to deal with your opponent's threat because you are in a position to threaten more. For instance, let's say your opponent is the first player of the game, and they play Hunting Witch. It's a two-power untamed creature with the ability, each time you play another creature, gain one amber. This is from Call of the Archons, the first set. So they've played that. You know, they're player one, turn one. They've got seven cards in hand. They play that as their turn one play. Then it's over to you. You look at your hand of six cards because you're the second player. You have one Shadows card. Out of the six cards, one of them is Shadows, and it's Oubliette, which is an action card that can purge a creature of power three or lower. And the rest of your hand is untamed, with two of those aforementioned hunting witches, a full moon, an action card that gains you an amber for each creature you play after it during a turn, and then two dust pixies, which are one power creatures with two amber bonus pips. So you've got a choice here, right? Do you control your opponent by playing that oubliette, which purges the untamed creature on your opponent's side of the board? But that's all you get to do that turn. And the opportunity cost is there. You're waiting another turn to use your untamed. Or do you say, you know, let's go ahead and play untamed and burst to a truly absurd amount of amber, right? So what are the questions we ask ourselves if we're thinking about Keyforge as a racing game and asking ourselves, who's the beatdown in this situation? So what big plays could your opponent make next turn if, if Hunting Witch lives? This will require uh, quite a bit of actually matchup knowledge and knowing that opponent's deck list. And as of the rules updates ahead of Winds of Exchange, if this is open Archon, right, you're going to be able to just look at their deck list at any time you like. So you ask yourself, do they have scaling amber control in their deck? That, that means... Do they have a card that would punish you for going high above six amber, right? There are some like Interdimensional Graft or TMTP that is uh, too much to protect. Then those cards actually take that amber from you in various ways. So if you go that high, you end up just giving it to your opponent. That's real bad because our total, if we played all of our untamed cards that I mentioned earlier, would be 13 amber. That's a lot. That's enough for two keys without any key cost modifiers. But if that opponent does have scaling amber control in their deck... Do we have a key cheat we might draw into if we play Oubliette on our first turn and purge their Hunting Witch and we have a small chance of drawing into our key cheat, right? What are the chances they have Scaling Amber Control in hand right now? So here's some other ways I might navigate that situation. The opponent likely wants their Hunting Witch to stay on the board, right? Uh, it's going to stay a target for Oubliette on a future turn. If our opponent doesn't have Scaling Amber Control, I might actually immediately go for the Big Amber play and save the Oubliette for our first Shadows turn, which will be later. We'll be taking a Shadows turn later pretty much no matter what, right? And hopefully, once they have some Amber for us to steal, and they're more likely to have Amber if they get some off of the Hunting Witch. Also, is there a creature in their deck that's more valuable to us then the Hunting Witch, for us to purge with Oubliette, something three power or lower that we could wait for if we know it's crucial. Maybe a Chota Hazri, which has play, lose an amber, forge a key at current cost, right? That's also an untamed. Or maybe they have Dust Pixies with Recursion, those two amber pip creatures I mentioned earlier, and ways to get them back and replay them. So if this opponent does have scaling amber control that steals amber from us, we could still do the untamed turn, but maybe we stop at six or seven. If they have something like Doorstep, Doorstep to Heaven, which makes us lose all but five but doesn't steal it from us, we actually might still risk going for the full untamed play just to tempt that out, tempt the Doorstep out this early and and get it, get it off the board, get it off the play, right? That might or might not be the right play, but it's an option depending on what the matchup looks like. So Keyforge is absolutely filled with these choices. Sometimes a single turn is absolutely full of these choices, and sometimes a turn is pretty straightforward. Because when you're looking at your board state, it's easy to lose sight of the true goal of the game. It's also easy to look at your board state and not accurately calculate how you can actually maximize that particular board state, because you're thinking of other combos or other things you want to get to later, and maybe not seeing what the board state looks like right in front of you. The board state being what's in your battle line, what's in their, their battle line, uh, what artifacts do they have out, you know, what are the, all the possibilities for both players and how do those interact? 
Sometimes the goal, thinking, okay, how do I get to that third key, right, is going to guide you towards a better play. And I mean, it should. Sometimes the situation is so complicated, and you've got to evaluate which lines of play among many gives you the best chance at winning, and several options seem good. Sometimes it is absolutely the right option to fight a few creatures off the board. So this advice, it's simple, right? And it's general strategic advice that won't give you a specific instruction on any one turn on how to sequence it, right? It's a mindset. It's an overall way of thinking about key forge that you have to boil down and apply to individual situations as you go. If getting better at Keyforge is like seeking out a distant city on foot, no, you know, no Google Maps, no anything like that. If if getting better at Keyforge is like that, you're on foot. Remembering that Keyforge is a racing game is like knowing which cardinal direction to go in. Do I walk north? Do I walk south? Do I walk east or west? And if you know that your destination, this city, you know, you've got no phone, you've got no map, but if you know it's east, you're headed in the right direction. You still have to navigate the paths in between where you are and that distant city. There's going to be obstacles and barriers in the way in between you and that destination, but you're headed the right way if you remember that, hey, Keyforge is a racing game. So how do I do that? Keyforge Public Radio is produced by Rooster High Productions, which is me. If you have any questions about how a podcast produced by me could serve your business, organization, or expertise, send me an email at zach at roosterhigh.com. To support KPR in our mission to provide the community with resources and raise the profile of this amazing game, join the Patreon, where you will vote on what content is next, discuss the show and share ideas, and receive discounts in the merch store. Speaking of the merch store, what better way to show off your love of Keyforge and this show by buying a KPR hat, shirt, or even a pair of sandals? On our website, KeyforgePublicRadio.com, you can read show notes, blog posts, and more, so give that a visit. Stay engaged with the show by following us on any social media platforms you frequent. Just search for Keyforge Public Radio. And remember, dear listener, the most important part of Keyforge is the person across the table.